Morfad sat in the midship cabin and gloomed at the wall. He was worried and couldn't conceal the fact. The present situation had the frustrating qualities of a gigantic rat trap. One could escape it only with the combined help of all the other rats. But the others weren't likely to lift a finger either on his or their own behalf. He felt sure of that. How can you persuade people to try and escape a jam when you can't convince them that they're in it? Right up to the neck. A rat runs around a trap only because he is grimly aware of its existence. So long as he remains blissfully ignorant of it, he does nothing. On this very world, a horde of intelligent aliens had done nothing about it through the whole of their history. Fifty sceptical Altarians weren't likely to step in where three thousand million Terrans had failed. He was still sitting there when Haraka came in and informed him, We leave at sunset. Moffat said nothing. I'll be sorry to go, added Haraka. He was the ship's captain, a big burly sample of Altarian life. Rubbing flexible fingers together, he went on. We've been lucky to discover this planet. Extremely lucky. We've become blood brothers of a life form fully up to our own standard of intelligence. Space traversing like ourselves, friendly and cooperative. Morfad said nothing. Their reception of us has been most cordial, Haraka continued enthusiastically. Our people will be greatly hardened when they hear our report. A great future lies ahead of us, no doubt of that. A Terran Altarian combine will be invincible. Between us, we can explore and exploit the entire galaxy. Morfad said nothing. Cooling down, Haraka frowned at him. What's the matter with you, misery? I am not overjoyed. I can see that much. Your face resembles a very sour shamshid on an aged and withered bush. And at a time of triumph, too. Are you ill? No. Turning slowly, Moffat looked him straight in the eyes. Do you believe in psionic faculties? Haraka reacted as if caught on one foot. Well, I don't know. I am a captain, a trained engineer navigator, and as such I cannot pretend to be an expert upon extraordinary abilities. You ask me something I'm not qualified to answer. How about you? Do you believe in them? I do now. Now? Why now? The belief has been thrust upon me. Morfad hesitated, went on with a touch of desperation. I've discovered that I'm telepathic. Surveying him with slight incredulity, Haraka said, You've discovered it? You mean this has come upon you recently? Yes. Since when? Since we arrived on Terra. I don't understand this at all, confessed Haraka, baffled. Do you assert that some peculiarity in Terra's conditions has suddenly enabled you to read my thoughts? No, I cannot read your thoughts. But you've just said you've become telepathic. So I have. I can hear thoughts as clearly as if the words were being shouted aloud. But not your thoughts, nor those of any member of our crew. Haraka leaned forward, his features intent. Ah, you have been hearing Terran thoughts then. And what have you heard that has got you bothered, Moffad? I am your captain, your commander. It is your bounden duty to tell me anything suspicious about these Terrans. He waited a bit, then urged impatiently. Come on, speak up. I know no more about these humanoids than you do, said Moffad. I have every reason to believe them genuinely friendly, but I don't know what they think. By the stars, man, you... We are talking at cross-purposes, Moffat interrupted. Whether I do or do not overhear Terran thoughts depends on what one means by Terrans. Look, said Haraka, whose thoughts do you hear? Stealing himself, Moffat said flatly, those are Terran dogs. Dogs? Haraka lay back and stared at him. Dogs? Are you serious? I have never been more so. I can hear dogs and no others. Don't ask me why, because I don't know. It is a freak of circumstance and you have listened to their minds ever since we jumped to Earth. Yes. What sort of things have you heard? I have had pearls of alien wisdom cast before me, declared Moffat, and the longer I look at them, the more they scare the hell out of me. Get busy frightening me with a few examples, invited Haraka, suppressing a smile. Quote, The supreme test of intelligence is the ability to live as one pleases without working, recited Moffat. Quote, the art of retribution is that of concealing it beyond all suspicion. Quote, the sharpest, most subtle, most effective weapon in the cosmos is flattery. Quote, if a thing can think, it likes to think that it is a god. Treat it as a god and it becomes your willing slave. Oh no, cried Haraka. Oh yes, insisted Moffat. He waved a hand towards the nearest port. Out there are 3,000 million petty gods. They are eagerly panted over, fawned upon, gazed upon with worshipping eyes... Gods are very gracious towards those who love them. He made a spitting sound that lent emphasis to what followed. The lovers know it, and the love comes cheap. 
Haraka said quite uneasily. I think you're crazy. Quote, to rule successfully, the rules must be unconscious of it. Again, the spitting sound. Is that crazy? I don't think so. It makes sense. It works. It's working out there right now. But take a look at this. He tossed a small object onto Haraka's lap. Recognise it? Yes, it's what they call a cracker. Correct. To make it, some Terrans ploughed fields in all kinds of weather. Wind, rain, sunshine, sowed wheat, reaped it with the aid of machinery other Terrans had sweated to build. They transported the wheat, stored it, milled it, enriched the flour by various processes, baked it, packaged it, shipped it all over the world. When humanoid Terrans want crackers, they've got to put in man hours to get them. So? When a dog wants one, he sits up, waves his forepaws and admires his god. That's all. Just that. Darn it, man. Dogs are relatively stupid. So it seems, said Morford dryly. They can't really do anything effective. That depends upon what one regards as effective. They haven't got hands. They don't need them, having brains. Now, see here, declaimed Haraka, openly irritated. We Altarians invented and constructed ships capable of roaming the spaces between the stars. The Terrans have done the same. Terran dogs have not done it and won't do it for the next million years. When one dog has the brains and ability to get to another planet, I'll eat my cap. You can do that right now, Moffat suggested. We have two dogs on board. Haraka let out a grunt of disdain. The Terrans have given those to us as a memento. Sure, they gave them to us. At whose behest? It was wholly a spontaneous gesture. Was it? Are you suggesting the dogs put the idea into their heads? Haraka demanded. I know they did, reported Morfad, looking grim. And we've not been given two males or two females. Oh, no, sir, not in your life. One male and one female. The givers said we could breed them. Thus, in due course, our own worlds can become illuminated with the undying love of man's best friend. Nuts, said Haraka. Morfad gave back. You're obsessed with the old, out-of-date idea that conquest must be preceded by aggression. Can't you understand that a wholly alien species just naturally uses wholly alien methods? Dogs employ their own tactics, not ours. It isn't within their nature or abilities to take us over with the aid of ships, guns and a great hullabaloo. It is within their nature and abilities to creep in on us, their eyes shining with hero worship. If we don't watch out, we'll be mastered by a horde of loving creepers. I can invent a word for your mental condition, said Haraka. You're suffering from canophobia. With good reasons. Imaginary ones. Yesterday, I looked into a dog's beauty shop. Who was doing the bathing, scenting, powdering, primping? Other dogs? Ha! Humanoid females were busy dolling them up. Was that imaginary? You can call it a Terran eccentricity. It means nothing whatsoever. Besides, we've got quite a few funny habits of our own. You're dead right there, Moffat agreed. And I know one of yours. So does the entire crew. Haraka narrowed his eyes. You might as well name it. I'm not afraid to see myself as others see me. All right, you asked for it. You think a lot of cash in. He always has your ear. You will listen to him when you listen to nobody else. Everything he says makes sound sense. To you. So you're jealous of Kashim, huh? Not in the least, assured Moffat, making a disparaging gesture. I merely despise him for the same reason that everyone else holds him in contempt. He is a professional toady. He spends most of his time fawning upon you, flattering you, pandering to your ego. He is a natural-born creeper who gives the terror dog treatment. You like it, you bask in it. It affects you like an irresistible drug. It works. And don't tell me it doesn't, because all of us know that it does. I am not a fool. I have Kashim sized up. He does not influence me to the extent that you believe. 3,000 million Terrans have 400 million dogs sized up, and are equally convinced that no dog has a say in anything worth a boot. I don't believe it. Of course you don't. I had little hope that you would. Moffat is telling you these things, and I am either crazy or a liar. But if Kashim were to tell you, while well, prostate at the foot of your throne, you would swallow his whole story, hook, line and sinker. Kashim has a terror dog mind, and uses terror dog logic. See? My disbelief has a better basis than that. For instance, some Terrans are telepathic. Therefore, if this myth of subtle mastery by dogs were a fact, they'd know of it. Not a dog would be left alive on this world. Haraka paused. They don't know of it. Terran telepaths hear the minds of their own kind, but not those of dogs. I hear the minds of dogs, but not those of any other kind. As I said before, I don't know how or why this should be, I only know that it is. 
It seems nonsensical to me. It would. I suppose you can't be blamed for taking that viewpoint. My position is difficult. I'm like the only one with ears in a world that is stone deaf. Haraka thought it over, said after a while. Suppose I were to accept everything you said at face value. What do you think I should do about it? Refuse to take the dogs, responded Moffat promptly. That's more easily said than done. Good relations with the Terrans are vitally important. How can I reject a warm-hearted gift without offending the givers? All right, don't reject it. Modify it instead. Ask for two male or two female dogs. Make it plausible by quoting an Altarian law against the importation of alien animals that are capable of natural increase. I can't do that. It's far too late. We've already accepted the animals and expressed our gratitude for them. Besides, their ability to breed is an essential part of the gift, the basic intention of the givers. They've presented us with a new species, an entire race of dogs. You said it, confirmed Moffad. For the same reason that we can't very well prevent them from breeding when we get back home, Haraka pointed out. From now on, we and the Terrans are going to do a lot of visiting. Imagine they discover that our dogs have failed to multiply. They'll become generous and sentimental and dump another dozen on us, or maybe a hundred. We'll then be worse off than we were before. All right, all right, Moffat shrugged with weary resignation. If you're going to concoct a major objection to every possible solution, we may as well surrender without a fight. Let's abandon ourselves to becoming yet another dog-dominated species. Requote: To rule successfully, the ruled must be unconscious of it all. He gave Haraka the sour eye. If I had my way, I'd wait until we were far out in free space and then give those two dogs the hearty heave-ho out the hatch. Haraka grinned in the manner of one about to nail down a dockyard tail once and for all. And if you did that, it would be proof positive beyond all argument that you're afflicted with a delusion. Emitting a deep sigh, Morford asked, Why would it? You'd be slinging out two prime members of the master race. Some domination, huh? Haraka grinned again. Listen, Moffad, according to your own story, you know something never before known or suspected, and you're the only one who does know it. That should make you a mighty menace to the entire species of dogs. They wouldn't let you live long enough to thwart them or even go round advertising the truth. You'd soon be deader than a low strata fossil. He walked to the door, held it open while he made his passing shot. You look healthy enough to me. Moffad shouted at the closing door. Doesn't follow that because I can hear their thoughts, they must necessarily hear mine. I doubt they can because it's just a freakish... The, the door clicked shut. He scowled at it, walked 20 times up and down the cabin, finally resumed his chair and sat in silence while he beat his brains around in search of a satisfactory solution. The sharpest, most subtle, most effective weapon in the cosmos is flattery. Yes, he was seeking a means of coping with four-footed warriors incredibly skilled in the use of creation's sharpest weapon. Professional fauners, creepers, worshippers, man-lovers, eco-boosters, trained to near perfection through countless generations in an art against which there seemed no decisive defence. How to beat off the coming attack, contain it, counter it. How to protect oneself against this insidious technique, how to quarantine it, or... By the stars, that was it, quarantine them. On Paladamine, the useless world, the planet nobody wanted. They could breed there to their limits and meanwhile dominate the herbs and bugs. And a soothing reply would be ready for any nosy Terran tourist. The dogs? Oh sure, we've still got them. Loads of them. They're doing fine. Got a nice world of their very own. Place called Paladamine. If you wish, you can go see them. It can be arranged. A wonderful idea. It would solve the problem while creating no hard feelings among the Terrans. It would prove useful in the future and to the end of time. Once planted on Paladamine, no dog could ever escape by its own efforts. Any tourists from Terra who brought dogs along could be persuaded to leave them in the canine heaven specially created by Altair. There the dogs could find themselves unable to boss anything higher than other dogs, and if they didn't like it, they could lump it. No use putting the scheme to Haraka, who was obviously prejudiced. He'd save it for the authorities back home. Even if they found it hard to credit his story, they'd still have to take the necessary action on the principle that it's better to be sure than sorry. Yes, they'd play safe and give Paladamine to the dogs. Standing on a cabin seat, he gazed out and down through the port. A great mob of Terrans far below, waiting to witness the coming takeoff and cheer them on their way. He noticed, beyond the back of the crowd, a small, absurdly groomed dog, dragging a Terran female at the end of a light, thin chain. Poor girl, he thought. The dog leads, she follows, yet believes she is taking it someplace. Finding his colour camera, he checked its controls, walked along the corridor and into the open airlock. 
It would be nice to have a picture of the big send-off audience. Reaching the rim of the lock, he tripped headlong over something four-legged and stubby-tailed that suddenly intruded itself between his feet. He dived outward, the camera still in his grip, and went down fast through whistling wind while shrill feminine screams came from the watching crowd. The funeral is delayed us two days, Haraka said. We'll have to make up the time as best we can. He brooded a moment, adding, I'm very sorry about Moffat. He had a brilliant mind, but it was breaking up towards the end. Oh well, it's a comfort that the expedition has suffered only one fatality. It could have been worse, sir, responded Kashim. It could have been you. Praise the heavens that it was not. Yes, it could have been me, Haraka regarded him curiously. And would that have grieved you, Kashim? Very much indeed, sir. I don't think anyone aboard would feel the loss more deeply. My respect and admiration are such that... He ceased as something padded softly into the cabin, laid its head on Haraka's lap, gazing soulfully up at the captain. Kashim frowned with annoyance. Good boy, approved Haraka, scratching the newcomer's ears. My respect and admiration, repeated Kasidim in louder tones, are such that... Good boy, said Haraka again. He gently pulled one ear and then the other, observing with pleasure the vibrating tail. As I was saying, sir, my respect... Good boy! Deaf to all else, Haraka slid a hand down from the ears and massaged under the jaw. Kashim favoured good boy with the glare of an unutterable hatred. The dog rolled a brown eye sideways and looked at him without expression. From that moment, Kashim's fate was sealed. <laughs>